Uh, the next talk is by Rafik Neem. Hello, good afternoon. Um, so I'm Rafik Neme. I've been working on de novo gene birth with Dieter Tauts for quite a while now. Um, and so I'm going to be presenting today work I did at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Biology. Um, but I'm now at Columbia University Medical Center in New York. Um, I'm going to be talking today about the exploration of uh, the sequence space um, as understood from de novo gene birth um, as getting new sequences that nature has not seen before, functional sequences that nature has not seen before, um, in contrast to what we would have when we have uh, duplication, in which you would have sequences that are similar to those that preceded them. Um, so just as a slight overview, so Ben, ben made a great introduction a, a talk ago. Um, new genes start as simple entities, so this, this de novo genes would start as simple entities, which we call protogenes. Um, in which we would have a region, an intergenic region, where there is no gene in the past, or in, an, in a different lineage related to this one. Um, at some point, we have a protogene, which is uh, a sequence that looks like a gene, behaves like a gene, but it doesn't have any function. Um, and it shouldn't have any function, because it's a stochastic product of the cell regulation. Um, and at some point, some of these protogenes are able to perform functions. Um, some of them are privileged and become genes. And so we have a de novo gene birth. And many of them have protein coding status, but of course, many of them are also just RNA genes. Um, this process has been studied in a bunch of model organisms. Um, I'm sorry for the people I couldn't put here, but it's basically everywhere where it's been searched for, it's been found. And from these, we've proposed something that's called a life cycle of genes, in which from non-genic sequences, there is a continuous production stochastic of protogenes, many of which, of course, just come back to be non-genic sequences. Um, but of course, some of them transition to become genes. And, and of course, we all know what can happen to genes. They can multiply and rearrange and whatnot. And, and of course, at some point, many genes also die. Um, so most of the work that's been done so far, it's comparative genomics. And comparative genomics implies historical reconstruction. So we, we are limited in the amount of stuff we can do with this. Um, and my idea was to explore random sequence space in a more practical way to, to try to move, move ahead and then try, try to see what happens if we do it in a lab. Um, so today I'm going to be showing you so exploration of non-genic material artificially produced. We wanted to emulate basic conditions for the novogen birth in the lab, so we make artificial proto, uh, protogenes. And we want to observe each random sequence over time in a population. And we want to see how cells respond to this uh, introduction of random sequences. Are we talking about most, most of the response being in, inert, or like the, the sequence space being inert, or mostly toxic? Um, or are we talking about a rainbow full of functions here? Um, so what we did is very simple. Um, we worked with E. coli, and we took an inducible expression vector off the shelf. We used antibiotic resistance, like ampicillin, um, and we make sure that we have a ribosomal uh, binding site, start stop coding, and we clone 150 randomly produced, artificially produced nucleotides. Um, we have this library that we can then transform into E. coli, and then we have a bacterial stock of single, single plasmids. We, we confirm that, that most of the transformations are single plasmid. Um, and from this, we start the experiment in which we take the cells, we let them grow for a while, we split them into different replicates, we let them grow again, we dilute 1 to 10 because we want to keep the amount of generations as little as possible. We want to see immediately after the insertion what happens. Um, and we do this. We let them grow for 24 hours. We do this for four days. I'm going to call this a cycle or a passage. Um, and this phase is um, what, we, what we have during the induction. And then every day we call examples for sequencing and for storage uh, to visit different days. And then we, um, we have all samples barcoded, we sequence each experiment, and then we are able to track the different frequency of each peptide over time. Well, we, I'm going to call a peptide an ORF, but it's an open reading framework sequencing nucleotide so far. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple of plots, and the idea is that you should focus on whether it remains on the x-axis. In the middle, it's, there's no change over time regarding to the first day, and then we will see if they're decreasing 
which I'm going to be calling deleterious, um, or if they're increasing over time, which I'm going to be calling beneficial. Um, and this is what happens over time if we don't put IPTG, so the population, there's, there's showing no change. And this is what happens if we induce, and here in, this, in the corner, I'm showing how many of these peptides are different, significantly different from the first day. And this was um, surprising to us that we would see this many. Um, another, another check we do is we, we see how diversity, I'm not going to show the plot here, but diversity in this kind of uh, setup stays stable over time. The diversity compared to different metrics of richness or different uh, representation of each um, peptide in the, in the um, like abundances and so on. And in this case, when we have, for the same case, we have um, IPTG deduction, um, the diversity decays sharply over time. So some, some things become um, more enriched, some things leave the population. Um, and we did two types of experiments, one which is a week-long experiment, which is four 24-hour passages, and we did one experiment, three experiments that are day-long experiments, which is four three-hour passages. Um, and each experiment, I, we repeated it at least three times, and the replicates are between five and ten times in each experiment. Um, so one thing we could do is we can sequence a lot, um, just to see how much we need, how much sequencing we need to be able to, to call things and then to see if we many seeing many different uh, deleterious or beneficial sequences. Um, and the deleterious sequences, we can find them quite easily. We don't need to sequence a lot. So we did an experiment which we sequenced the library five times in the MySeq. And at 10% of the total sampling, we we're able to catch most, or most of the deleterious sequences. It's like 60% at 10%. Um, but as, as, as we increase more and more sampling, we are able to find more and more of these beneficial sequences. Um, so this, this comes to the, the point where it's, uh, very, it's very exciting to us right now that we find that most sequences have some kind of reproducible effect in the population, um, which is completely inexpect what's completely unexpected for, for me, at least at the beginning of, of the experiment. Um, we find that most of the sequences so 50% of the sequences are deleterious, or look like deleterious. Um, a lot of them look beneficial. When I started the experiment, we were hoping to find one, two sequences that would be like gold. Uh, right now, we're surprised that we're finding so many. Um, and of course, we have, we have a very small proportion of sequences that are non-significant um, or show different signals between different experiments. Um, and this is what I'm showing you. It's a, it's a collection over many, many experiments. Um, the other thing that is important here is that because of the size of the total experiment, we have uh, about two million peptides, um, but many of them we only see once or twice when we sequence. Um, I limited the analysis that I'm showing you here to things that I find once, at least five times in one replicate in one day, um, which means that I'm working here with about a thousand peptides. Um, and of those peptides, this is, this is the result. So this is what we're seeing. And from this, we have 66 sequences that are always found on all experiments and are always increasing, of which we took three cases, picked at random, um, and we did pairwise comparisons in the lab, pairwise competitions, in which we take um, an empty plasmid and this sequence, and the, the sequence that we put is always increasing in frequency. As many, we can repeat this experiment as many times and it always takes over the population. Um, and we have 312 cases that are always detected and are always decreasing. Uh, we're in the process of confirming those. Um, and we have many more showing experiment specific behaviors. Um, so here, uh, when, you know, when I started this, I thought we were gonna have some kind of like needle in a haystack situation. But well, turns out we have like a stack of needles. So we, we are really surprised that we have these many sequences that have some kind of effect in the cell. Um, I, I want to make a callback to, to Jack Shostak's experiments in the early 2000s, um, where they found one in one, four in, in 10 to the minus 12, uh, 10 to the 12 sequences um, that had ATP binding proteins, uh, protein um, function. Um, we do not find a lot of neutral cases here, um, or neutral looking like. Um, so what we're thinking is that random sequences act as some kind of bioactive scaffold, um, and then selection either removes them from the pool for being deleterious, um, or is able to improve them affinities. 
and we are able to generate new functions, well, hopefully we're able to generate new functions, or um, see older functions recapitulated using different mo new molecules. And this, of course, I, I think this is uh, of extreme relevance for the pharmaceutical and biotech industry. Um, depending on the screen we do, we can basically select from this pool of sequences for different processes. So right now, what's next for, for our system is um, we're doing single sequence confirmation analysis. Um, we want to see if the effect is coming from protein, so from the protein coding ability, or just from the RNA. Um, we're doing molecular dissection of the phenotypes. Um, and we're taking also, doing random mutagenesis of the candidates we found to have a positive effect and see if we can get better effects. Um, and trying different stressors, changing the host cell. Uh, we're doing this in E. coli, and we would want to see how this performs in different systems, eukaryotes, hopefully. Um, getting structural information, and the end goal of this is getting the distribution of fitness effects of the whole sequence space, just to see whenever a new gene is born, is it more likely to produce something that will have some function um, or not? Because the, the question turns out to be, is, is this kind of like a lottery that is difficult to buy in, in eukaryotes and prokaryotes? Difficult to buy, but when you buy the ticket, you always win? Or is it something more like you rarely buy the ticket <laughs> and it's, it rarely happens? So in this case, so from comparative genomics, we were expecting to see some, some sequences. Um, and from this, it turns out there must be other restraints um, because from the biochemical side, from the random sequence part, um, there doesn't seem to be that much of a limitation. And with this, I'd like to thank uh, Dieter for his support on this project, which at the beginning sounded like a kind of like a wild idea. Um, Christina, Burshin, and Ellen, who did most of the experimental part, um, and the Max Planck and the ERC for generous funding. And with this, I'd like to take questions. Time for questions. Um, can I ask a question? Uh, is it possible that there's something toxic in the plasmid and your inserts just alleviate the toxicity? Um, it, it's, it's possible, although we've had the experiment with the empty plasmid um, and IPTG induction, and we see uh, the same. Um, so just, just no behavior, right? But it, it's possible. We are also thinking that it might be a toxic effect from the proteins that are expressed, and what we're seeing is different toxicity just, just from the random peptides. Um, but it, this would still make some cases that are always going increasing in frequency hard to explain like that, just like that. Um, I remind you that this experiment was, um, other than the 66 cases, were over six different experiments, each of them replicated almost ten, six, uh, ten times. So it's, these are incredibly replicated. I have you tested any of them in more than one environment? Could, could it be that this, the surprise comes, you just test this one environment and it's pretty easy to be good in one environment, but many of these wouldn't be any good in any other environment? Right. So, we, so, 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 so therefore they wouldn't really you know, come up in yeah, the real so, world. So, um, what the is asking is if there is an effect from the environment or, and, and if this would make sense if, if we put them in a different environment, we'd see a different result. Um, what I'm guessing is if we put them in different environments, would expand the amount of sequences that would have some kind of function um, in, in the sense that um, it, can only, it can only increase. If you have an effect somewhere, you, you know, you have already once, once the effect. Um, one thing we're trying right now is stressing them with different conditions, like different salts, heat, and see if they respond differently, but we're still not uh, there yet with the results. Okay, I have just a question about the uh, experimental procedure. I'm not sure to understand why you compare at day one and day five rather than compare directly with and without IPTG, which may be a more direct measure of the fitness effect. Because if you have like one of these sequences that express something that's deleterious and then the cells have a little bit of time to adapt to it and maybe they can recover between day one and day five, but still the absolute effect is deleterious. I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding your question. <laughs> Like, phonetically. <laughs> oh, okay, so maybe we can talk about that after. Um. Thank you very much.